good job of teaching your children to be obedient. Genesis 1, 28, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, <laughs> replenish the earth and subdue it. So we're doing that, really, I mean, it's right out of this class. <laughs> okay, we're going to have some uh, fun today. We're in 2 Timothy, and we can start now tying things together. Hopefully we'll have one of those aha moments. You know, when your kids and they're growing up, they always ask you, well, why? Why this or why that? You're not playing this street. Why? Well, because you get run over. You know, well, don't put your finger in the light socket. Why? Well, because you'll get electrocuted. And if we understand the why, the why, and last week I said, well, we're going to figure out what we're here. I mean, what, we're, what are you doing today? Today, Park City's Baptist Church, in this class, what are we doing? What are we doing? And those questions will be answered. And we started a couple of weeks ago, and we looked at the three phases, what Paul called, what we call the golden chain. That chain of going from faith to faith to faith, and we started with justification. And then we went on to sanctification. And then to glorification. So our journey is from is from dust to glory. It's dust to glory. And we're justified. When we're justified through Christ, justification takes care of the penalty of sin. And then we walk on in sanctification. And sanctification, what it does what? It takes the power of sin on your life. It deals with the power of sin in your life. Takes care of that. And then in glorification, we're finally, you're completely relieved from even the presence of sin. And so that's our journey. And so we're going from justification to sanctification and to glorification. And that's what 2 Timothy is really all about because 2 Timothy is laying out the pastoral epistle. This is how it's done. This is how you do it. And then he started by adding in the pastoral epistles to Timothy and then also in Titus. We have what? Grace. Grace, and then peace, and those are found in all the epistles. He starts out in his greeting, grace and peace, in every single epistle, the general epistles, the prison epistles, and then we get to the pastoral epistles, and he adds mercy. All right? And we looked at mercy, and we saw that God has never treated anybody unjustly. Never. He has never been unjust. We either receive justice, or we receive mercy, one of the two, and he decides that. And I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So we're in 2 Timothy, but let's go back to the garden. And let's take a peek and let's look. We're going to go from dust to glory today. All in one second. Amen. Let's go back to Genesis 1. And we track through the creation. And then we're in the garden. And then woman is made. And then man is made. And then in chapter 3, that ominous chapter. And it starts out. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field the Lord had made. And he said unto the woman, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And so we have studied this out before. And so what happens? After they eat, they understand that they're <coughs> naked. They have some clothes. Make some clothes. And then in verse 8, chapter 3, verse 8 of Genesis. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Is that not interesting? Now, they're married. They're man and woman. They were cleaving to each other. They understand nakedness. And afterwards, they birth other children. We have Cain. We have Abel. But there is this understanding that, you know what? I can't be in the presence of God can't be in the presence of God. And isn't that interesting? They're hiding there among the trees. They're hiding among the trees. And we'll tie this on later on. Ultimately, you know what? Ultimately, we hide We hide behind the tree too. And we really do. I mean, we really do. And that's what justification is all about. They were hiding because we cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. We cannot do that because what do you see? Now you understand good and evil. You understand the difference. And man understands, oh, you know what? I'm not good. I can't do that. I must be justified. And God has made a way. So we looked at a couple of the Psalms, and we're going to start out today in Psalm 135. And we saw how God had chosen the Jews and raised up the Jews. And we answered the question, why did God choose the Jews? 
Because he wanted to. He wanted to. He decided. He wanted to choose Jesus. Now, of all the folks, and even in Deuteronomy, he, Moses is writing down, he's, you know, you're not chosen because there was really anything inherently righteous about you. You weren't chosen because you were the largest population. You weren't chosen because you were free men. You were slaves. You had no land. You had no property. You're stiff-necked. And we looked in, in Jeremiah as we studied that through. They're rude, disobedient, adulterous. They engaged in syncretism, the merging of many gods. They did everything wrong. Well, the Lord has is able to foreshadow those things and foreknow those things. Why would you choose a people like that? Why would you choose a people like that? All right. We're going to answer this question. Let's go to Psalm 135. Let's go to Psalm 135 and expand this just a bit, and we'll start tying this all together. Psalm 135. Similar theme, second verse. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord. You know, we got a song. Praise him, O ye servants of the Lord. Ye that stand in the house of the Lord, the courts of our God. Praise Him, praise Him, praise ye the Lord. Right? Okay, three. What? I missed that one. Oh, you didn't know that? Did I the other one? No. It's a, it's a, I guess it was a crusader class. Yeah, it was, it was Psalm 135 and something. All right. Verse four. For the Lord hath chosen Jacob unto himself, and Israel for his peculiar. <coughs> for I know that the Lord is great, and that our Lord is above all gods. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that he did in heaven, in the earth, in the seas, in the deep places. He causes the vapors to ascend to the ends of the earth, <coughs> and make things for the rain, bring the wind out of the treasuries, he smote the first born of Egypt, both man and beast. And we're looking here, and we see that everything that God, everything that God does, everything He does, is good. That's right. Everything. Everything He does is good and right. And man tends to think, well, I know what's good, and I know what's right, and we won't decide on our own what's good and right. It's not good and right because we think it's good and right. It's good and right because God wills it, and He ordains it, and He sees it through. And that's what makes it good and right. And after all of creation, all of this has to do with God's election. He gets to choose. He can make frogs jump if He wants to. And He can make raccoons climb trees if He wants to. He elected all of this. And it comes down, He did all these things, but you know what? He also chose Israel. He also chose Jacob. And when we get to 2 Timothy, what's Timothy? In the letter to Timothy, he said, you know what? He's also choosing you. Why? He gets to choose. He gets to choose. All right, verse 9. Who sent tokens and wonders in the midst of thee of Egypt, upon Pharaoh, upon his servants, who spoke great <coughs> nations, slew mighty kings, Sihon of the Amorites, Ah, king of Bashan, and all the kingdoms of Canaan. And he gave their land for a heritage, a heritage unto Israel, his people. Thy name, O Lord, endureth forever, and thy memorial, O Lord, throughout all generations. For the Lord will judge his people, and he will have compassion concerning his servants. So he takes the Hebrews, who are slaves, and he takes them to a land that's already occupied. It's already occupied by the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Gershites, and the Philistines. They're already there. Now, is it fair that God chooses these stiff-necked people, who after 40 years, they were so wicked and evil, he had to make them all die out before he could even bring them across the Jordan. And he puts them in a land of total heathens. Absolute total heathens. Now, is that fair to the heathens? <laughs> is it? No, it's not. It doesn't seem fair to us. The poor you know, they, they dug their wells, they built their houses, they had their vineyards. They're probably good people. Yeah, no, they're no, they're not. Well, they probably <laughs> Sorry, Brenda. They've they done their best. They, they take care of the widows and the orphans, most likely. 
they thought they were fine. They ate them. <laughs> <laughs> they ate their young from time to time. He puts them in this lamb. <laughs> and, and look, look at the prince. Let's look at the prince. He's taking a stiff-necked, awful group of people, and he's setting them right in the center, right in the center of Canaan. All these heathen, these absolute heathens. Why did he choose them to begin with? To be a light to the world. Now they come in there. We say it's not fair to the heathens. Well, were any of the heathens converted? How about Rahab the harlot? The harlot had heard about them. And heard about what had done to the Egyptians. And heard how they crossed the Jordan. They're crossing the Jordan in flood stage. They crossed it at the worst possible time of the year. And they did that. How did they do that? They're taking the Ark of the Covenant and they walk into the Jordan. And the Jordan dries up. It splits. And they walk across dry land. The Canaanites are going to understand that. This whole army passed through the Jordan, and that's impossible. But what did they do? Oh, no, they said, you know what? We need to stop these folks. No understanding of, well, maybe this actually is Yahweh. But not only was Rahab saved, who else was saved? Her family. Her family. Her family. She asked for her family. She didn't ask for them to save her. She asked for them to save that's her family. Right. And not only did she ask that her family be saved, we, Rahab, where does she show up in the New Testament? In the genealogy. In the genealogy of Jesus. And you know they found the portion of the wall. Where she found the wall. Archaeologists have found the portion of the wall where Rahab's house was. It's the only portion left standing. <coughs> and the reason it's the only portion is that we would find it. Okay, it's just, I mean, the stones cry out, they really do, with archaeology. So he takes them, he sets them in the middle of a heathen people. Out of this heathen people that eat their young, he takes a prostitute, the worst of the worst of the worst. I mean, the, the, you take the heathens and the worst of the worst, the person on the lowest point of the sexual ladder, and she becomes a direct descendant of Jesus Christ. Not only that, she and her family inherit some of the land, don't they? They show up later. They, they show, she shows up later. It's they inherit some of the land. All the promises. Why would he do that? Why would he do that? But there she is. This brightest day, Rahab. Okay. All right. So he chooses these people because he <coughs> wants to, but why? <laughs> Let's go to Deuteronomy 7.6. <coughs> calling them out. And Moses is calling them out here. Deuteronomy 7, 6. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people. <coughs> For you were the fewest of the people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers, that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondage and from the hand of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, which keeps his covenant and them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. He chose them to show them mercy, and he chose them because of their stiff necked wicked ways. Because he knew they would engage in syncretism. Because he knew they would shame and embarrass the Lord. He knew that of all the people, they needed quite a lot of work. But why would you do that? Why would you do that? Okay, let's let's keep let's keep going on. Let's go over to John. Let's go to the New Testament. Look for some confirmation. John 15. And hopefully, remember we asked uh, we used to have the little dark rooms. We're going up in the church. Ronnie Purnell, the Purnells, they had these dark rooms. Plus one dark room. And so Ronnie would take pictures, and his brother Greg would take pictures, and we'd go in there, and it was all dark. 
and you can kind of see the picture just like coming, coming up, and kind of look at it, and it's in the solution, kind of stir it a little bit. Oh well, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Okay, this is going to start bubbling up now. Uh, John 15. And this is the vine and branches sermon, and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up, uh, let's pick it up in verse 8. It's talking about your vine, branches, you can't do anything without me. In verse 8, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. And we understand that concept. And Paul extrapolated on that concept because he said, look, the Jews are the root of the tree. They're the root, and you're grafted into the root. And if you're not grafted in or not part of the root, you will produce no fruit. <coughs> I understand that. That's easy. Nine. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Which love came first? <coughs> As the Father loved me, Jesus, so have I loved you. Continue me in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. And this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So we're this is starting to bubble up now. He, the Lord loved Jesus. Jesus loves us. And he's telling us to what? Love others as I have loved you, a reflection of how my Father loved me, right? When you love, but love, you, you give, right? When you love, you give. And then when I counsel kids that are about to get married, or 13, this is it. You want to know, you want to know when you're really married, you get, get married. When you're ready to get married, this is it. 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his read a, a thousand books on the subject of love and not be any the wiser. <coughs> this is true love. When you're willing to lay down your life for your mate, <coughs> you have found true love. If you're not ready to do that, I tell them, you shouldn't get married. And there's some people who should never be married. This is the litmus test. Alright, and then in verse 16, let's go on. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of my Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. So the context here is of love, the context is of bearing fruit. He's bearing fruit, he wants us to bear fruit. Well, what kind of fruit, what kind of fruit does he want us to bear? He's telling us ultimately to love one another, and that's where it all incepts. We memorized Psalm 2, did we not? Well, I think we did. Let's go back and look at it. In case, in case, in case we've forgotten a little bit. Remember Psalm 2. Oh, he's talking about the heathen. Why did the heathen rage? Okay, they're raging. And the people imagine a vain thing. If you don't think they're raging, just pick up the newspaper. They rage against the things of God. They're protesting in the street with signs and screaming up at that. And, uh, generally a bad attitude. <laughs> they're just raging. Always mad. Just always angry. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Who? Against who? Against the Lord. And who? Against his they rage against the Lord and against His anointed. And that's just, you can go anywhere in the planet. You really can. And I'm not traveled everywhere in the planet, but it doesn't matter. Latin America, Europe, it doesn't matter where you go. Everybody curses the name of Jesus. The cabbies, you know, the people at the bus stand, everybody. Why? Because that's where truth is. There's no power in, in saying, oh, Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> you ever hear that? You know, watch some Hollywood movie. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. There's no power. It doesn't matter where you go. Why? They, in the, in the, the scripture's true. They rage against the truth. They rage against Christ. The heathen do. 
And verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We're not going to be bound by these statutes or these principles. We want to break free from those. And look what the Lord's response is. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. But the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And here he's talking about the Savior, about Jesus. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And I will declare this decree. The Lord said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And here's the key in verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathen for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. So, what's he, what's he saying here? Look, ask of me, my son, that I've set you upon the throne on the holy hill of Zion. Ask of me, and I will give you the heathens. Well, if you were in your job and you were hiring, would you hire the worst, most undisciplined people you hire, you hire absolute heathen. But we say, well, you know what? I'd rather have somebody good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Say, bring me, bring me the, the, the worst. Bring me the heathens. Oh, why would he do that? Okay, let's go back to the New Testament. Let's go to um, 2 Thessalonians 2. Right before Timothy. We'll, let's go over to 2 Thessalonians 2.
his very start. He gets this vision of heaven. And what is his first inclination? Hide behind the tree. Really? Really? He understands the holiness of God. And he makes his confession. I can't get there. I don't belong there. Not only am I unclean, everybody else is too. What chance have we? But he chooses Isaiah, and I don't think Isaiah is making this up. I'm sure he was a man of unclean lips. But he understands this, and he dedicates, he understands the difference between he and the holiness of God. And it's that aha moment, he says, oh. And he dedicates himself to the things of God. He goes up against Ahaz. He, he, he withstands all types of persecution, all types of personal derision against him because of his understanding of himself and how to be made right with God and to help others get there. Okay. So if you've got that, if you've got that going on already, why would you need anybody else to come and worship? It seems like heaven's already taken care of. It seems like everything's holy. Everything's going really well. Why would you want heathens to join into that crowd? Let's go over to Luke 4. In, in Jesus' very first sermon, he brings us up. He, he brings us up in his very first sermon. And, you know, let's see how that goes. And... In verse 18, Luke 4, 18, he quotes Isaiah, right? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of the sight of the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptance of your Lord. And so he closes the book, and that's that shot that was heard around the world. And he sat down and he says, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your Lord. And they're looking at him in verse 22, and they bear witness to him and wondered at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? And so Jesus goes on to say, you know what? You're going to want me to do exactly what I did in Capernaum. And I tell you the truth, no man is accepted in his own country. And here's what he brings up, verse 25. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up for three years and six months, great famine was throughout the land, but unto none of them was Elijah sent, save to Sarepta, a city of Sidon, and a woman that was a widow. And he said, what? The Lord can choose to save whoever he wants to save. But those are a wicked people over there. Why would he go over there and do that? Because he wanted to. And he makes it worse. 27. And many lepers were in Israel at the time of Elijah, the prophet. And none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. He said, hey, you know what? There are these people in Israel. But God chose to reach out to wicked lands and supernaturally intervene in the lives of men and women because he wants to. And what happened here? It's their self-righteousness. Wait a minute, wait a minute. But we're the ones in the temple. We're the ones here with the scriptures. He chose us, remember? Why would he go out there and do something for the heathens? Because, well, look, they're heathens, right? And so what happens in verse 28? And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. He should have stopped the sermon, you know, probably about six verses earlier, right? Because they weren't so angry that he made them really angry. Then what do they want to do? And they rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built. They might cast him down headlong. We're going to throw this guy on his head. Off the mountain. But he passing through the midst of them went his way. Same kind of reaction. Same reaction. When Jesus was in his ministry in those three and a half years who did he go see? Who were some of the examples of people that he went to see? Mm -hmm. Tax collector. Tax collector. Prostitute. Prostitute. The worst of sinners. 
the worst. And that was the accusation that the priests and the Pharisees brought to him. This man eats dinner with sinners. He can't be called a God. Because we're the righteous ones. We're the ones following the law. He's obviously not a man of God because he would not hang around all these people that were unclean. And you go to the very, very end of the ledger, and who is he healing? Talk about being unclean. The outcast of the outcast of the outcast. And those are the ones that he's going for. Those are the ones he's calling out. He's taking his ministry. Yeah, he takes it to the temple, but he's taking it to the worst of the worst of the worst. Okay? All right. Let's go to John 6, 37. And we'll start putting this all together. John 6, 37. Bread of Life sermon, and in 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And that's our doctrine of, really, of once saved, always saved. Is that sound doctrine? Take it to the bank. Take that one to the bank. There's never been a more sounder doctrine and I know we Baptists call it once saved, always saved. Take that one to the bank. I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my no will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which is said. That of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up against the last. What's the will of God? What is the ultimate, overarching, overriding will of God? For the Lord God to give the heathen to his son, right? That they should not be cast out, and that they should raise, be raised up in the last day, verse 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Going down to verse 44. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him. And I will raise him up in the last day. This will of God, the promises of God, the reason they inure to us is because this promise was made to the Son. This promise was made to the Son. I have the Lord. Right? And there's an inter-Trinitarian promise. And that inter-Trinitarian promise to Jesus is, I will give you the heathen for your inheritance. All right, we saw that in the psalm. We see that throughout scripture. I'm going to give you the worst of the worst of the worst for your inheritance. Why? Why? These, among the many attributes of God, these three attributes, grace, mercy, and peace, are attributes that the angels in heaven and the cherub in heaven could never understand. They could never understand. They were never fallen. They were never lost. They were never cast down. They were never in a position to need the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God. Mm -hmm. When we start in Isaiah, and we see they're saying, holy, 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 is that what we're going to be singing in Revelation? Is it going to be the same song? The song of Moses, we studied the song of Moses a while back, but what's the other song we're going to sing? And why is it necessary that we sing that other song? Let's look at the last principle, and here's our answer. It's in Luke 7, 41. Luke 7, 41. the parable of the creditor. And there was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And 
when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to him he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And right after that, we have the broken and spilled out with the oil in which he can speak. To those who have been forgiven the most, those are the ones that will show the most love. Because the, full, the, the seraphim and the cherubs in heaven, they cannot serve God in the fullness of all his attributes. They cannot do it. Because this is part of his character. In their cries of holy, 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 They've not experienced that character. They don't experience the fullness of who God really is. Only when you take the worst, most downtrodden, most vile, most awful sinner, even his best works are filthy rags, then you raise that person. You take the worst of the worst, and you justify them, and you take care of their sin. And then you sanctify them, so that you can take them on this journey from dust from dust to glory, to the very presence of God. A man who understands that he is dust, but able to share ultimately in the glorification of God, what kind of worship is that man capable of? Greater worship than the angels. Greater. And that's what the scripture says. The angels look down, they don't understand what they pray, so what we do. Because they don't understand sovereignty. They don't, they don't understand that. And that's why he's chosen us. Because in that inter-Trinitarian promise, the Lord promised Jesus, I'm going to raise up a people. We're going to make man. We're going to make him in our image. And this man is going to have the capacity to worship and serve. And you will share in your glory with this man who is going to understand where he came from. And that's the highest type of worship that you can possibly have. The absolute highest type of we have, I, I'm impressed with what's going on in Isaiah. You haven't seen anything until we get there. Really, really. When John the Baptist, when he's walking up and, and, and Jesus comes to be baptized, what does John say to Jesus? I'm not worthy. Yeah, yeah, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. He understands that. I'm going to hide behind the tree. I'm not worthy. And what he says, behold, the Lamb of God. And in Revelation, what are we singing? Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. <coughs> Worthy is the Lamb. It's an elevation of worship. And that's what we're called. And that's why you've been called out. And that's why you've been singled out. And that's what you're doing here right now. Because we understand that we've been justified. And we understand where we're going. We're going to be glorified. And your life, our lives, that's the present to Jesus. He chose you and pulled you out so that he could present you to Jesus Christ. And Jesus gets the gift, and what did he say? Whoever the Father gives me, I will in no wise cast out. One saved, always saved, is because you are the gift that God has given Jesus. And he's saying, thank you. That's his gift. That's his gift. I have, I have a gift. Right here. I have a gift. And let's see, who's going to get this gift? <laughs> Phil Bobby's <laughs> Phil, tell us about this gift. Phil is a, you know, he's a gem dealer, and Phil understands things of very great worth, and I think that gift has great worth. Tell us about that gift, Phil. Uh-oh. 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 <laughs> it's a carb dyed agate. <laughs> not to be an appreciative yeah, not, but. <laughs> it looks like it has a bronze leaf on it <laughs> that gift is a gift that Phil, Bobby, and Jan took to a what elephant party <laughs> that we had like several years ago yeah. and I had gotten to the white elephant and I forgot my gift and so the Bobbies had brought two so I they gave me one of those gifts to use so I could participate in the white elephant thing. Okay. I'm re-gifting that back then. <laughs> <laughs> and they're appreciative. Oh, okay. Let's go keep back. 
<laughs> I knew Phil would know what it was because he bought it. <laughs> that, Our yeah. Dad bought it. Dad. Now we know what's really what it is. It, it's a bronze thing that's covered that makes it look like marble. It looks more expensive than what it really is. And isn't that true when we give gifts, you know, like a Christmas or something? We want the person to think it's worth more than what we pay. Absolutely. That's human nature. <laughs> really was for us. That's where your self worth is. You're worth the blood of Jesus Christ as a gift to the Father. And that's why he made man. And that's what we're doing here. And that's why we're on the planet. And what's our responsibility? To bear fruit? To love them. How do you love the Lord? You love the Lord by loving the people he loves. Why? So they can be redeemed. And they too can go from dust to glory. And everything else is just a Everything else, it's just a distraction. This is ultimate truth. And that's what Timothy is telling us when he talks about the golden chain. Pastors, church, do this. And this is the why. This is why you're doing it. You're in church right now. Because you understand you're on your way to be glorified. And other people are looking at you and they're seeing what makes them different. Why is their life so interesting? And what is that doing all those great things like? And then they can come on that. They can come on that journey too with us, right? The Great Commission. It's still the Great Commission, yeah, right? Okay. Well, okay. We'll pick up next week, and uh, we'll tie up with a couple more verses, and we'll move on to the rest of the first chapter. Too. Okay. All right. And musicians, y'all gotta go. We're starting early today.